Hello and welcome to Swipe. Coming up, the seriously smart phones. We've been tracking down the engineers who say it's time for an alternative. Dot London is dot live. Why Britain's capital has a new domain name. Can you crack the code? The YouTube videos that have got people talking. And Spider-Man is swinging back into action in this week's games review. When it comes to smartphones, most of us tend to gravitate towards a few key brands. But if you want to use the technology, are you limited to the likes of iPhone or Nexus? As Katie Spencer has been finding out, it's not just engineering enthusiasts who are looking for alternatives. Here we have my latest little widget. Forget about the iPhone. How about a Pi phone? Taking the Raspberry Pi's cheap and cheerful board computer as a starting point, for less than £100, software engineer Dave Hunt managed to build his very own smartphone. You can take GSM functionality and touchscreen functionality and make projects that you wouldn't do with, with phones. He isn't the only one who's experimenting. While there's no disputing that iOS and Android dominate the smartphone market, a growing number of enthusiasts are choosing to go their own way. And if you're confident enough to risk invalidating your warranty, installing what's known as a custom ROM can mean greater control and the ability to use a mobile without the restraints of the carrier. But with most of us lacking the technical know-how to experiment, just how much of a choice do we really have? Well, there are free and open alternatives, and there have been for many, many years. I mean, the free software movement has been going for 30 years, but it is inaccessible to regular people. And one of the greatest challenges of our time is to make free and open technology accessible to mere mortals. At the Brighton offices of IndiePhone, this fledgling tech startup is hoping to ruffle a few feathers. Started following whistleblower Edward Snowden's mass spying revelations, the company is building a smartphone which promises to free users from corporate surveillance by decentralising personal data, making it harder for third parties to get to. We are pretty much aware that the government really shouldn't have all of this information, right? But why should corporations have them? Why do we trust their motives more? Ideally, you should be the only one who has that information unless you want to share it. So if you want something to be private, it should be for your eyes only. But does the company really stand a chance of competing against the big boys? The trouble is, is that, of course, uh, it's hard for other vendors to really compete with the marketing clout and, and existing brand appeal these firms have with their devices. Uh, so whether or not competitors that are trying to break into the market can, uh, can do that is hard to tell. Clearly, the biggest smartphone names will take some toppling, but critics argue we could all benefit from having greater choice. Katie Spencer, Sky News. You're watching Swipe coming up. Spider-Man is swinging back into action. But first, what does London have in common with New York, Berlin and Vienna? The nightlife, museums, coffee? Yes, but also now it's joined a list of cities that have got, or soon will be getting, their own domain name for web addresses. Dot London is here, but is it any good? Stuart Duggan's been finding out. We all know dot com and dot co dot uk, but now there's a new kid on the block. Dot London follows in the footsteps of dot NYC, which went live in March. London officials are confident the new domain name will prove popular in an age of town-specific currencies where there's a desire to think and buy local. People, you know, long for a sense of place on the internet. There are quite a lot of uh, apps and software now which is about locating yourself, whether that's business-wise or individually. And so we think the time is right now for a global city like London to take its place, if you like, on the internet, injecting really for the first time this kind of sense of urban geography. And of course it will make them money. Organisations, businesses and individuals in the city can now apply for a dot .London address. Companies that sell them say there have been 50,000 expressions of interest. Not all reaction has been positive though. Critics say dot .com gives you an easier to remember address with a global presence. And there's another problem. The way we use the web has changed. People use uh, search engines effectively as browsers. So they will type it in. There's no need to change and add a dot London. If you are, it knows where you are because it can see, you know, it understands where your computer or your mobile phone, smartphone is. Um, so, so all you need is the name of the business. 
Which is a fair point, when was the last time you manually typed in a web address? Some companies are already using .london alongside their previous websites, notable examples being upmarket retailer Fortnum & Masons and West Ham Football Club. Other companies with a .london domain name insist it will be useful. We're exporting to, say, 30, 35 different countries, and when they think of uh, the UK, they tend to think of London. What with the last couple of years, London really, really being at the, the heart of what's going on in, well, in the world, really, with the, the games that happened and everything, um, it was a great chance for us to highlight our London credentials to, to those markets. Londoners are being given priority to apply for the new addresses for the next three months. They cost around £50. Money raised from the sales will be used to promote London tourism and business around the world. Stuart Duggan, Sky News. You're watching Swipe coming up. Can you crack the code? The YouTube videos that have got people talking. But first, ever wondered what the astronauts will wear when they eventually fly to Mars? Well, the US space agency NASA has revealed all, as Swipe's been finding out. The suit, as we said, is evolving. They're going through slowly. They're going to carry out lots of tests. They'll be having uh, volunteers uh, working uh, inside the suits inside a vacuum chamber. And they're also going to be testing it out on a simulated Mars area so that they'll be working out amongst the rocks and dust and uh, checking how the suit stands up to that. It's uh, an evolutionary design. They produced a previous one, Z1, this is Z2, and elements of this will be incorporated into this design of Z3. It's much further from the sun. If you're lucky, in the summer, uh, at the equator on Mars, you might get up to about uh, freezing point. <laughs> so the temperature uh, is a major factor. The suit has to protect you against that. It has to keep you warm. It also has to protect you against the fact that it's very, very low atmosphere. It's pretty much close to a vacuum. So you need protection against that. Also, the suit has to provide the wearer with oxygen, take away their carbon dioxide, and you've got to include a radio so you can keep in contact with uh, your fellow astronauts. Unlike the Apollo missions where they were out on the, the surface of the moon for up to uh, three days at a time, we're expecting astronauts to be exploring Mars for weeks, uh, months and so forth. So the suit has to be very robust. Coming up, we've a few dark fairy tales on this week's Games Review. But first, here's a roundup of anything you might have missed over the last few days. It had been rumoured for a while. Now, Facebook has launched its audience network. Mark Zuckerberg revealed his plans at the F8 Developers Conference in San Francisco. The idea is to serve ads to third-party apps, which Facebook promises should be more relevant to the user through Facebook data. Yahoo has announced it's moving into program making, commissioning two of its own original TV series that will air on its websites and mobile app. The shows will be comedies. One's called Other Space, the other Sin City Saints. It follows the lead of sites like Netflix, Amazon and Hulu, which already make their own digital video content. Meanwhile, when it comes to watching movies on the move, the big boss of DreamWorks believes we'll soon be paying per inch. Jeffrey Katzenberg from the studio, which gave us animated greats like Kung Fu Panda and Shrek, set out his vision of the future at a conference in Beverly Hills. Ten years from now, he says he expects a movie to be available on all platforms within 18 days. Not only that, but he thinks we'll be prepared to pay more for screen size. In other words, it'll be cheaper to watch on a smartphone than on your TV. It's a new way to pay, backed by most of Britain's major banks. Payum has had a fairly strong launch in the UK, with 360,000 people registering for the service in the last week. The idea is you can pay back someone you know using just their mobile phone number. Although some people have been a little nervous that it looks a little bit too easy, the Payments Council has said all banks using the service have signed up to strict security standards. And finally, the conspiracy theorists have been getting overexcited this week with much debate taking place over these YouTube videos. More than 77,000 have been posted online, each only 11 seconds long. 
Nobody seems to be able to track down the person behind the mysterious web driver torso account. So naturally, that's led to wild speculation over what on earth it could be. Could it be a form of super spy communication or just a code? Who knows? One thing that is for sure is that it is rather annoying. So please just make it stop. Much better. Now, this week, if you're a gamer, there are a host of exciting and entertaining titles that are worth checking out, from dark fairy tales to some familiar film franchises. Lucy James has been giving us her picks. Child of Light is uh, the latest game from Ubisoft Montreal. It's this gorgeous 2D artwork. It, looks, it basically looks like a child's picture book. And you play as a, as a little girl named Aurora, and she's, uh, she's kidnapped from her father and she's put in this gorgeous land called Lumeria. And she has to basically get all the light back from the evil queen of the night. Everything's done in a poem, all of the speech, everything's this one long poem. And it's a gorgeous story and it's all about her. You follow her as she grows up. Um, and she has all these friends that, you know, they all band together and they have to deal with all these nightmares that they find in the land of Lumeria. The gameplay is pretty cool as well. It's sort of like a Japanese role-playing game. You have a little timeline on the bottom and you have to predict your attacks before and get hit in before the enemy does. It's all about, you know, really taking your time and figuring out where things are going to go in the timeline. So it can get a bit complicated. Child of Light is really gorgeous. It's a downloadable only game at the moment, um, but it really is. And, you know, it's one of those games where the artwork really stands out and the music as well. Um, everything ties together really beautifully. Hello? Daylight's the first uh, kind of big title to be released using the Unreal 4 engine, which for gamers is really exciting because it's a very technologically advanced engine that a lot of other bigger games are going to be built in. Uh, Daylight's pretty small, you can finish it in a few hours. Uh, it's a horror game. Uh, and every encounter is different, so it'll play out differently every time you play, uh, whether it's the, the rooms that uh, get created or the enemy encounters you'll have. You play as a woman named Sarah, and she wakes up in an abandoned asylum, which is kind of like the classic horror game setting. What's really cool about Daylight is uh, it's kind of built with Twitch in mind. So Twitch is an online platform where people can play video games and broadcast them over the internet. Uh, Daylight's built so that people in the chat logs, while they're watching the game, can input commands and directly affect the way that the gamers' uh, levels play out. It'll be interesting to see how the community all works together to figure out what these commands are and how they can terrify the bejesus out of people playing this game. Octodad Dudley's Catch is, uh, is out for the PS4 now. Uh, it's a sequel to a game that was just made by a bunch of students. And it's got a really unique premise in that you play as an octopus who's trying to masquerade as a human. He wears a lovely three-piece suit and uh, his, his arms and his legs are, you know, his tentacles and even his little moustache is made of his tentacles, which is he's really cute. But the thing is, obviously, he doesn't have bones, which makes kind of getting around quite difficult and also he sticks to things. So you're trying to control this octopus that's flailing around and the aim of the game is to not get recognised as an octopus. You have to try and be a human. Uh, so he's kind of put into everyday situations like taking his family to the aquarium or going shopping or mowing the lawn. It's just a, a crazy kind of experience. It's, it's a very unique gaming experience, but it's very funny. Amazing Spider-Man 2 recently came out in cinemas and there is a tie-in game to go with it. It's uh, following the story of Amazing Spider-Man 2, the movie. So uh, you're Peter Parker, you're trying to find Uncle Ben's killer, it's all very emotional. Um, but they've introduced a whole bunch of new features, so when you shoot webbing out, it can you know, either freeze or explode enemies. It's quite, quite cool, just rather than just sticking an enemy to a spot. There's a lot of famous enemies, you know, there'll be Green Goblin, uh, Craven the Hunter, um, Kingpin even. So they're kind of doing something for the comic book fans there as well. Andrew Garfield sadly isn't in it, but it will have a, a good, hopefully a good story that kind of closely mirrors the movie. That's it for this week. Remember, you can catch up with all the breaking tech stories all week on Sky News for iPad, our smartphone apps, and skynews.com. See you next time. Bye-bye.